I'm Kathleen Hirsch, and I am the co-chair of the Washington County League of Women Voters, as well as being on the state board. Um, the League of Women Voters is a 100-year-old organization that believes in active participation in government. And this is <laughs> um, part of what we are uh, being active in is redistricting reform for the state of Oregon. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Candlin Johnson, and I am currently the redistricting coordinator for the League of Women Voters of Oregon. Um, so I work in the state office, but I will be transitioning in just like two days uh, to work full time uh, for the campaign, which I'll be going into a little bit and a bit um, as their deputy campaign manager. Um, but a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today and who else we have here to join joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is People Not Politicians, the campaign that's advocating for redistricting reform in Oregon. Why has the League joined this effort and why does the League support redistricting reform and why Oregon needs it? You know, what is redistricting? What is currently happening in Oregon? And, and Lastly, how can we enact reform? What can you do if you want to be a part of this movement? Um, so a quick little history of, of the League's efforts in redistricting. In, 27, in 2007, the League published a study on the issue of redistricting. The League never forms a position on something without an extensive study first being done. And the League of Women Voters of Oregon has a position on redistricting that um, advocates for an independent redistricting commission. So we, went, we then went around in 2018 and 2019 to over 25 different redistricting forums across the state. And we got public input. And then we formed a coalition called People Not Politicians and began advocating for fair and transparent redistricting to be put on the ballot this November. So we'll be going over the history, some of those problems. You're welcome to type in questions as we go, but um, I might answer the question in my little PowerPoint presentation I have for you. Um, and so if you want to just remember the question, have us answer it afterwards, you're welcome to type it in the chat or the Q&A at any time. Um, but I won't be answering them until the end of the presentation. Norman, who I'll introduce in just a second, will also be answering questions. Um, and Trish, if she feels like it. Um, just a, one last housekeeping thing that I want to help in case you're using the chat feature. Uh, so when it says to all panelists, you want to make sure that if you want everyone to see it, including attendees, that you check all panelists and attendees. So for instance, if you're asking a question that you would like everyone to know you're asking, make sure you're checking and attendees. Otherwise, it's just us on the screen um, that will be able to see your question. Um, the other thing, just in case some of you aren't familiar with Zoom webinar, is that uh, we can see each other, but we can't see any of you as attendees, and you as attendees can't see yourself or anyone else. Um, and that's something that's interesting about Zoom webinar that's different than Zoom meetings, and that's why you can't see anyone but our panelists today. So with that, I want to go ahead and give it over to Norman, who is the uh, chief petitioner for the ballot initiative. Uh, and is one of the leaders of People Not Politicians. So, Norman, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Candlin. I'm also the campaign chair, uh, so trying to lead this charge in some fashion. Uh, it's kind of like herding cats, but uh, I'm also a immediate past president of the League of Women Voters of Oregon and uh, the president of the League of Women Voters of Oregon Advocacy Fund, which is a separate organization that has no members and uh, I am here to answer your questions uh, particularly at the end I will state right off, uh, off that I want everybody to start taking this campaign as an emergency we have about five weeks left to uh, gather 150,000 signatures we have a, a plan that we think we can get there it's not uh, for sure, of course, but uh, we think we have a very good shot at it and everybody uh, on this call and in the organization, uh, if they take it seriously and help us get signatures uh, for the next month or so, I think we can do it. So I think uh, I'll turn it over now, what, to Trish or to, uh, okay, Trish, take it away. Okay, thanks, Norman. 
Um, as many of you may know, I'm the state public policy chair for American Association of University Women of Oregon. I'm also on the National uh, Public Policy Committee for AUW. Um, I always like to start by saying, uh, mentioning our vision, which is on our new website, which I suggest you guys check out, national website, auw.org. But we are tenacious in trailblazing, quote unquote, advocating for women and girls since 1881 and into the future. It's a pretty good vision statement. Um, we are absolutely delighted to be working with the League. Norman and um, a number of other people have been putting in an amazing amount of work in this. Um, I guess the one thing I want to say is I hear redistricting, and that sounds like some like, what? What's, what's redistricting? Um, you know, I think a lot of times uh, the process determines the outcome much more sometimes than the substance, you know, what the facts are. Well, the process here is how we vote. And what we're talking about is how, and most importantly, who decides how voting districts are gonna be drawn. So fairness in elections is something that's really critical to AEW and AEW Oregon. I'll leave the mechanics to others, um, obviously be more than happy to answer the question, but we're talking about voting fairness, so everyone has an opportunity to weigh in. Thanks. I guess right. that means I'm next. <laughs> um, I work with Trish uh, on a statewide basis. I am president of the uh, uh, Hillsborough Forest Grove branch of the AAUW. Uh, we have about 40 women of all ages that work very closely. Um, to help implement um, the vision and the strategies that um, our national level um, uh, uh, does for us. Um, we do a lot of programs, we sponsor information sessions, we award grants, and we work very closely with the state and, um, and other like groups, like the League of Women Voters of Washington County, um, to, um, to look politically at some of the, of the areas uh, we need to, again, locally. So our impact is local, uh, although we do bring that up to the state when we talk about testimonies and things around uh, that of, of particular concern. And we are a very active group of women and, um, and, um, and we, uh, we work very closely together. And um, we're looking forward as a co-sponsor to this particular redistricting webinar and hope to do other things with the League of Women Voters as well. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen for you all. I have um, a short presentation uh, and then we'll go into our Q&A session. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. Okay. There we go. So a little bit more about People Not Politicians. Uh, People Not Politicians is a broad, diverse coalition that has come together from all party affiliations, income levels, background, identities. I always tell people, um, just from a personal standpoint, that it's been so fascinating working um, for this coalition because you have people sitting across the room from each other who probably haven't agreed on much since before 2016 that agree that redistricting should be fair and that voters should be represented. And so it's been really awesome working with such a diverse group of people. Um, and it's just a, a really, really diverse coalition. And that's been really great to watch. The coalition is made up of thousands of Oregonians who believe we deserve the best representative government. The League joined the coalition because we support redistricting reform that would make our system less susceptible to abuse and upper unrepresentative distortions. With an independent redistricting commission, we can take the process of redistricting out of the hands of partisan politicians and back into the hands of voters. So new district lines based on this year's census will especially be important because Oregon is actually projected to gain a sixth congressional district, which is super exciting because it means another state will lose one. Um, I'm just kidding. But, uh, the, but it also means that we'll be drastically changing the way that we've been drawing lines for decades. Uh, so if we're already changing the ways that we've been drawing the lines, we want to make sure that it's fair for voters. 
So biased political goals can manipulate this process of redistricting and affect election outcomes, both at state and national levels. We really believe that Oregon voters should be choosing their politicians. Politicians should not be choosing their voters. So a little bit about, about what is currently being done for redistricting in Oregon. Every 10 years, there is a US census that's done. Uh, the states are given the responsibility of redrawing their own congressional and state districts. Currently, Oregon legislators are the state legislators are the ones who draw both state and congressional districts. Their plan can then be vetoed by the governor. When the legislature can't decide on a map by the deadline, which happens often in our history, the, or the governor successfully vetoes a, a map, then the responsibility shifts to the Secretary of State to draw the state districts and the congressional districts go to the Oregon Supreme Court. If there are challenges to those maps, which there almost always are, then the courts take over that process to review and approve the maps. So there's definitely some splitting that happens in our current process. The process for drawing congressional legislative districts has for far too long in Oregon been controlled by politicians. Letting politicians manipulate voting maps is like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Politicians in power shouldn't be allowed to draw voting maps that benefit themselves and their party, but that's exactly what they do now in Oregon. So I don't know how many of you have seen this gerrymandering graphic before, but when we're talking about redistricting, often what abusive redistricting processes is, is gerrymandering. And gerrymandering is a big word that I think it's hard to conceptualize how it actually is implemented by people who are in the redistricting process. And this graphic does a really good job of breaking it down in a really simple way that I love. Uh, so just a quick run through, gerrymandering is when elected or appointed officials in charge of a redistricting process reconfigure districts to favor a political party incumbent or a candidate. Uh, this is often referred to as uncompetitive races or safe districts that result from gerrymandering where incumbents very clearly have an advantage and never lose. So there are two ways that gerrymandering is often implemented by legislators, especially with the help of recent technology. The first is example number two, compact but unfair, and we call this cracking. And what this is, is when the majority party in a state gets control of redistricting and it cracks the minority party voters into as many districts as possible, making it so that no matter how many red voters come out to vote in those districts, they're not going to be able to change their representation and blue wins all five of those districts. This is where you might get people to feeling like it doesn't matter if they vote, it's not going to make a difference. They're never going to be heard. And this could be very discouraging for league members who want everyone to, to have their voice be heard. The third example, neither compact nor fair, is what we call stacking. And this is actually how if the minority party gets control of redi the redistricting process, they could end up getting more seats than their population distribution um, and what makes sense. So that's how there ended up being three red seats because the red party smushed and stacked all of the blue party into as little amount of districts as possible. This could also be an example of bipartisan gerrymandering. And the last example, number one, that says perfect representation, the league actually does not think that this is perfect because this could be a really, really good example of bipartisan gerrymandering. These districts are highly uncompetitive and these are very clearly could be safe districts. This could be both the red and blue party getting into a room, having closed negotiations and negotiating as many safe districts as possible for their parties. So a lot of people ask, what does gerrymandering actually look like in Oregon? And I wanted to share this with you all. Gerrymandering has been made a lot easier with the point of technology to the point where there actually have been legislators in Oregon who've said that their house has been drawn out of their district and they had to rerun, they had to move in order to rerun or to run for their district, right? So technology is, it can get very specific when it were, when they're drawing districts. The, uh, the way that gerrymandering can be measured is through the efficiency gap. Uh, a metric developed in 2015 by academics Nicholas Donopoulos and Eric McGee, and it's an important, just one important tool that can be used. 
So the Brennan Center for Justices, Eric Petrie explains that the efficiency gap counts for the number of votes each party wasted in an election to determine whether each party enjoyed a systematic advantage in turning votes into seats. So Oregon typically isn't considered a state that has the worst gerrymandering, and I would agree with you, but the state does have an 18.9% efficiency gap advantage for Democrats, which actually gives us one extra Democratic uh, congressional seat, according to the data analysis social activism outfit, Azabia, which is what this graphic is from. So some reformers say that the efficiency gap should be no more than 7% in order for it to be what we would consider fair. Oregon has the, strong, the fourth strongest efficiency gap among uh, states favoring Democratic candidates and actually ranks 11th overall in the country for the highest efficiency gap. Oops, all right. So a little bit about what reform, redistricting reform looks like across the nation. So although People Not Politicians is based in Oregon, it's important to note that leagues across the country are working on redistricting reform. And we're a part of a much larger national effort to fight against gerrymandering. In June of 2019, the US Supreme Court left the fight for redistricting. And it really made it so that it's up to each state to protect their districts from partisan gerrymandering. The People Powered Fair Maps National Program was launched by the League of Women Voters of the United States in September to, of 2019 to create fair, transparent, people-powered redistricting processes that eliminate partisan and racial gerrymandering nationwide. The League of Women Voters of the United States is working with each league uh, in each state because each state has a separate process and it's really important that it's, it's a local effort to make sure that the process of drawing political maps are designed with communities in mind, uh, that redistricting is a political process, but that that process fails when it's used to silence the voice of underrepresented communities. As recently as 2018, there are, are actually five other states that have passed redistricting reform on the ballot, and those are Colorado, Michigan, Missouri, Ohio, and Utah. And as you can see here, every single state in the country is working on redistricting reform in some way or another. So a little bit about Oregon redistricting history. According to a 2012 City Club of Portland study, prior to the Oregon legislature's success in 2011, 1981 was the last time the Oregon legislature sass, uh, successfully passed a redistricting plan. But following a lawsuit, the lines were later modified by the Secretary of State. So before 2011, the last time the legislature successfully passed a redistricting plan that became the final plan was 1911, which means in 100 years, the legislature failed to pass a redistricting plan by the deadline, usually due to partisan differences. In the case of 2011, uh, Oregon had a bipartisan committee and House was evenly divided with Senate leadership that value bipartisanship. Republicans backed off their insistence that Multnomah County be one district, but the final plan allowed for districts one and five to become more Republican. The, the Republicans were also motivated by the, uh, to compromise because the Secretary of State at the time was Democratic Kate Brown. So the result was a bipartisan gerrymander where each party limited negotiations and tried to keep as many districts as possible. Opposition of this reform will typically use the successful 2011 redistricting process as an argument as to why Oregon doesn't need reform. Um, but according to a study done by Ballotpedia on the competitiveness of elections after the 2011 redistricting cycle, Oregon had a net loss of three competitive elections. Following several cycles of redistricting plans drawn by the Secretary of State and the Oregon Supreme Court, the 2011 cycle the league sees is very unique and we do not think it could be easily repeated. It's also important to note that the legislature is not required to even have a bipartisan committee and you could end up having in the next redistricting session more people from one party than another drawing your districts. So the Oregon legislative model allows space for abuse. Major uh, majority party legislators draw lines that, that give advantages to their party and disadvantages to my minority party and third party candidates. Leadership of the majority party can use the redistricting process to reward 
or punish rank and file members of both parties. Despite recent advances, Oregon communities of color are underrepresented by elected officials that share their lived experiences. Major parties are incentivized to work together to protect incumbents over the interests of third parties, minority communities, and outside candidates. And lastly, partisan conflict in a split legislature or executive can lead to an inefficient, inefficient process or a failure to pass a map. We need reform now because politicians have an inherent conflict of interest in the redistricting process. Maps drawn to protect incumbents are less likely when non-legislators draw those district lines. If commissions are multipartisan in membership, then partisan, bipartisan, and incumbent protecting gerrymandering is less likely. Independence of a commission keeps redistricting from becoming a bargaining chip in the overall legislative process. And voters should, cannot hold their representatives accountable if politicians are choosing who their voters are. So just really quickly, I, I want to make sure that you all aren't fooled about what an independent commission is. There's two key questions you have to ask when a redistricting reformist is telling you that they're advocating for an independent redistricting commission. The first is, how are the members going to be selected? Who is selecting them? And the second is, how is the decision made to adopt the plan? Does the independent commission actually have the final say, or do they still need to get approval from the legislature? So I really don't want you to be tricked. That's why I gave you this official definition, and that is what this reform is all about. It's a commission that is composed of individuals who are neither legislators nor other public officials, and they were selected after a screening process conducted by another independent entity. Legislators may not serve on the commission or on the independent entity that selects the commissioners. So the reform was created by the state -like, uh, statewide coalition, and it is actually following the successful 2010 California model, uh, where they actually did successfully have a redistricting session with their independent redistricting commission in 2011 and found their, their uh, districts to be more competitive. Our proposal has been one of the seen as one of the strongest legally sound reforms in the country by redistricting advocates and has so far gone through the court process with little to no hiccups. We know that through polling, Oregonians support reform, and we've seen through the initiative process that we have a strong measure. To enact redistricting reform, we are going through the initiative petition process because it is a amendment to the Oregon State Constitution. So I want to go into a little bit about what the commission is and how the commissioners are selected. To ensure a fair independent commission, people with conflicts of interest need to be screened out of the pool of applicants. So the panel of administrative law judges who make up that independent entity I was telling you about that screens in the commissioners would select the commissioners and any staff of agencies tasked with supporting the independent commission. To qualify to sit on the commission, an individual may uh, serve on the commission if they, were if they are registered to vote in the state for the three years preceding the initiation of the application process have been registered in Oregon with the same political party or unaffiliated with a political party and have voted in at least two of the three most recent general elections or has been a resident of Oregon for at least the previous three years. Major donors to political candidates or parties would not be eligible Neither would elected officials, political party officials, or their family members. Commissioners would be selected to represent the broad diversity of Oregonians and would be required to follow strict criteria when drawing district maps. So I have a handout that goes over the conflicts of interest and this graphic in a little more detail. Um, we'll also make sure that you have the full text of the measure to read um, when I follow up with you all. But uh, a little summary is that the Secretary of State shall provide office support for the commission and the commission staff as needed. Um, Oregonians would apply to serve on the commission. The applicant review panel made up of those administrative law judges would nominate fa uh, finalists into three pools. So as you see here, there's like a little uh, funnel and that's the review panel nominating the finalists and screening out those conflicts of interest into what you'll see here as 50 from the largest political party in Oregon, 50 from the second largest political party in Oregon, and 50 other, which would mean the independent party, unaffiliated voters, or any of our third party voters. 
the final commission would have 12 Oregonians chosen. So that would be four from each of those pools. And 10 public hearings would be held with at least one of those public hearings being in each congressional district. And maps drawn and adopted need to be a multi-partisan decision. So there needs to be at least one commissioner from each of those pools in that final vote in order for it to pass. So the commission would have the same federal requirements that would apply to redrawing districts. Borders would be drawn with respect to geographic and voter diversity, reflecting city, county, other natural boundaries, as well as language, racial, or other communities of interest. Favoritism or discrimination against any political party or office holder is also prohibited. Uh, we would just include some additional requirements to the Oregon statutes where to the extent practicable, recognizing that redistricting is a very complex process and a lot of these seem like, and sometimes they do conflict with one another, that redistricting map should be designed in a manner that achieves competitiveness. We want to increase transparency and public participation in the process. So all work and data will be public record of the commission. Multipartisan and majority vote of commissioners are required for maps to be adopted and passed. We want to prevent partisan legislators, special interest lobbyists, party leaders, and political strategists and staff from influencing the process. We want to create positive impact for all Oregonians by creating balanced leadership focused on equal representation by their elected officials, greater opportunity for underrepresented communities like low income Oregonians, persons of color, rural Oregonians and seniors to elect representatives of their choice, better geographic, economic, social, community and political diversity of our elected officials and elect legislators who are more representative of their districts who will work effectively to enact policy that Oregonians want. So now to talk about the fun part, how can we actually enact redistricting reform in Oregon? What is the campaign doing right now to make this happen? So the campaign is working hard to engage voters during this public health crisis by actually having the petitions mailed directly to households. Um, for voters to access the petition online. So the, peti the campaign actually just sent out uh, 500,000 uh, uh, mailer petitions to households, and those households will have um, a high propensity of voters. So there needs to be at least two voters who voted in the last two elections. Um, and we're really excited about that because this is the first campaign that's ever sent a mailer that big before and been the main way that they're collecting petitions right now. And it's really, really cool to see. One thing to note about the 500,000 is that if you haven't requested one and you want a petition mailed to you because you don't have a printer, you need to email sign at because I'm not sure if you're going to be a part of that 500,000. If you want one, we want to make sure you get one. So make sure you request one if you want one in the mail. So if you want to get a single line petition and you know you have a printer that can print, then all you have to do is go to the People Not Politicians website and click on the sign the petition button and follow the instructions. To complete the petition online, the signature sheet, the signature sheet must be printed on 20 pound, eight and a half to 11 white, uncoated white paper. That's likely the printer you are, the, the, the paper you already have in your printer at home. It cannot have anything else on the back. I've seen some people who print out the e-sheet that it has something completely different on the back because they're trying to recycle paper. It cannot have anything on the back. Um, it's just that one page. You also want to make sure that you print the PDF, not the website. Um, so you need, to, you need to click sign the petition and print the e-sheet that shows up on your screen. If any of that sounds confusing and you want help in that process, you can email sign up people, not politicians, and a volunteer can walk you through that process. Um, but I will make sure, and I actually gave Amanda the link where you can go right now to sign the petition online by going to the people, not politicians website. It's also important to remember that if you're printing out and completing a petition that you're actually the circulator and the signer, which is really weird because we're used to people coming up to us as the circulator and signing a petition, but that just means you have an extra line to sign. And the instructions will show you how to do that. So after you print out and sign your petition, hand signed, 
you will mail it to People Not Politicians P.O. Box. Uh, and I will make sure that I type that into the chat for you as well, but it's all over the website too. It's on the petitions. Yeah, and it's on the petitions. It's everywhere. So what's next? Um, here's the link again, if you want to copy and paste it or, or write it down. I, I, I have Amanda sharing it in the chat as well. Um, but this is where you can go to sign a petition online today for that single line e-sheet. If you want multiple lines, email sign at and we can send, the campaign can send those to you. I know some people live with multiple voters in that household. So maybe you want to just print that one piece of paper instead of printing out five. That's understandable. We'd love to help you with that. So other ways that you can, um, that you can make lasting change and ensure this gets on the ballot is, um, I would say join your local league today if you haven't joined your local league. Um, see what else is going on just besides redistricting. They're doing lots of stuff in your community. Um, help others find out how they can sign the petition. This is a really weird time and getting involved and keeping involved in democracy is, is hard sometimes if things are so different. So if you know how to sign the petition, make sure others do too. And like, follow, and share the People Powered Fair Maps campaign and, and the Leo and Voters of Oregon on social media. We really believe that Oregonians want and deserve a fair process. And now for the rest of the time, I will go ahead and unshare the screen so I can start seeing your questions. And Norman and I um, and, and Trish or, or Claire, if they have a great answer to a question, are welcome to answer questions as well. But I think we're ready to start answering some questions. And just um, to make sure you all know, I will be sharing uh, this, slide, this PowerPoint slideshow with you all as well um, and a recording so that you have this information not only for yourself, but people who weren't able to make it today. Thanks for listening to me talk too much. Okay, we have a few questions already showing up. One is from Mary Holdman, um, and they ask, I just checked my paper and it's 24 pounds. Does that mean I can't use it? <laughs> well, unfortunately, no. Uh, you want to use 20 pound paper, which is the normal printer paper that you can buy in any store. Uh, you'd probably have to actually go out of your way to buy 24 pound paper, which is a little heavier. Uh, the Secretary of State has some very strict uh, requirements. It has to be 20 pound white uncoated paper. Uh, and I don't think we can do anything about that. We have another question from Joyce Zook. <clears throat> One of the original Secretary of State candidates interviewed by LWV at CCTV stated that she did not feel the current initiative would assure representation of Native Americans. Why would she make that comment? Candlin, you want to try that one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, actually. I don't know what her motivation is. Uh, I will say that uh, the process that uh, we've set out in our initiative is actually very respectful and inclusive of uh, various ethnic and racial groups. Uh, and compared to what the legislature does, uh, the legislature will give lip service to various uh, groups of people, but in the bottom line, they will be protecting their own interests rather than the interests of any group of people that uh, might support them. Native Americans uh, are one of those groups, perhaps. Uh, and yeah, what I might add as well, um, I'm assuming that this was a Democratic candidate. Um, and so the Democratic Party of Oregon has remained neutral. Um, but um, I will say, and this is common for pretty much any state in the country um, that has legislators as the people who are drawing district lines, that the main opposition, and this kind of goes into the other question, which is what kind of opposition are we getting and do we expect to get? The main opposition of redistricting reform is from the people who are currently in power. Um, and so that would be party leadership and the people who stand to gain from um, a redistricting system where legislators can draw their own districts. And this is, can be true for any party across the country. Um, what we find is that redistricting reform, the opposition is from 
the legislature mainly and from those people who gain to lose the most from the system being reformed. Trish. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I think one of the most important aspects of this whole uh, reform is transparency and the fact that the public, you know, there are public hearings, um, there are public records. Um, this is not, you know, uh, destined to be a, um, you know, the traditional behind closed door kind of thing. It's transparent. There are public hearings. Uh, these, um, everything is public. And I think that goes a long way to ensure that uh, underrepresented uh, populations will have an opportunity to see what's going on and to actually engage and join into the uh, conversation. So I'll go even further. Um, I want to make it very clear that this is not a partisan issue. This is not about Democrats versus Republicans as much as uh, our opposition would like to, to make it that way. Uh, this is a matter that is a process issue. It uh, cuts both ways and the shoe can be on the other foot. And it often is. So don't get sucked in by the partisan rhetoric of our opponents. Uh, they're trying to protect their interests uh, in uh, not having the voters uh, be able to replace them. So uh, I think that's uh, got to be very clear that uh, we're not uh, opposed to any political party or candidate or anything else. We want the voters to win. And it's the voters really against the powers that be in the state is the actual issue here. Um, we have another question about, uh, can we sign the petition online or do we have to print and sign it and mail it? Yeah, I can answer that. So you have to print it, sign it and mail it. You can't just um, send it to me via email uh, or send it to the campaign via email. It has to be printed, hand signed and mailed in. It can't be scanned, it can't be copied. Um, it has to be the original document. So when you go to that link, you will be directed to print out the e-sheet, sign it and mail it to us and we'll turn it in for you. We have a question from uh, Chris Kobe. Um, and they ask, can we see the polling that indicates that Argonians support this reform? Uh, I'll, I'll take that. And the answer is a simple no. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, it was overwhelmingly in favor of reform. Uh, the poll itself was not about the particulars of our initiative, but uh, more general questions about redistricting and we see that there's a great deal of support across the political spectrum on this issue. We have almost no doubt that if we can gain the ballot uh, by getting enough signatures that the voters will readily agree. The voters understand the dangers of gerrymandering and they've shown that very uh, adequately in the last election where five different states passed ballot measures about redistricting. We have another question from Michael Holcomb, and they ask, will the redistricting commissioners be volunteers or will they be hired by the state and be reimbursed or paid to do this work? Um, this is a, a detail about the petition and the commission. The commissioners are selected from normal voters, but once they become commissioners, they will be reimbursed for their time and expenses. And in fact, they will remain commissioners for 10 years. Uh, they won't be working all that 10 years and only will be paid for the time that they actually put in. But if something comes up, a court case or, or other challenge to the uh, commission, the commissioners will still be in place for the full 10 years of, of the uh, redistricting. Um, I see we have one questioner that is joining us by phone, and I would like to let that questioner know that they can use um, the keys of star nine to raise their hand if they wish to ask a question. Another uh, question from anonymous attendee, 
How close are you to the 150,000 signatures needed? What is the deadline to collect signatures? I don't know. You want to answer that, Kendall? And you were looking yeah. at petitions today. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can answer that. Uh, we just re launched our our campaign. I think a week and a half ago, and so people are just and and we just sent out the 500,000 uh, mailers to households. Um, just uh, like literally yesterday and so we're expecting to get a lot of them very soon so far i think we only have about uh 600 uh out of the out of the 150,000 and we have until july 2nd um officially um you'll want to get into us like one day or two days before july 2nd so we have enough time to follow up with you if it wasn't correct and that kind of stuff but the official deadline is july 2nd for those signatures and I do also want to clarify again um, that if you would like a petition mailed to you, please email sign up because I'm not sure. I don't know if you're going to be a part of that 500,000. Um, I have a question because I think I printed out and mailed mine in, probably not on 20 pound paper also like Mary. So um, will the um, campaign contact me if it is incorrect? That's yes. a great question. The goal is yes. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. yeah, the goal is yes, they will. Um, we this is obviously going to be a volunteer effort with staff. Um, we'll have people whose specific job it is to be following up with folks who, um, for some reason or another, their petition was invalid, and that's something that that follow up. Um, often, it's either volunteers who are spending a lot of that time or we have to pay for it. And so it's really up to our volunteers how much follow-up we're able to do. But th that is our goal, um, is that you will follow up. And um, follow up with me after this, Kathleen, if you want to make sure that it was valid and all that. Okay. So all of this is pointing out how important and urgent this campaign is that for everybody who's listening in tonight, and everybody you can think of in your personal networks should uh, work to get these signatures in as fast as possible. Uh, we have a, a three-pronged plan that uh, is, we think can get the signatures we need. Uh, the 500,000 direct mail pieces that were sent out uh, beginning yesterday, <clears throat> that, uh, maybe 10% of those will actually come back. There's multiple people in each of those households, so that could account for uh, 100,000 signatures right there. Uh, we have within our coalition uh, lots of different constituents. Every one of them is a membership organization of some kind. And there's about 100,000 uh, constituents in our combined organizations. Uh, we think maybe half of those will actually get a petition back to us. And uh, that's the 150,000 signatures we need right there. Uh, we have to account for some of them being invalid. So eventually we'll have to get out onto the streets and collect some more signatures if at all possible. Right now we're not uh, working on that, but uh, I think uh, as we get into June, uh, we will probably be doing that. So that will give us the buffer of the signatures that we need to get over the uh, qualifying mark. So uh, cross your fingers and uh, everybody, uh, do the best we can. Trish, I saw your hand. Okay, you're just doing such a good job. I don't want to interrupt you, but, uh, um, and really you are, Norman. You oh. know, you, you, you really have done so much work on this. I have a great amount of respect for you. Um, in any event, um, I don't know why I plugged you here, but um, there's a question, of Linda O'Hara, mm -hmm. is uh, AUW Oregon gonna join the effort? Absolutely. I'm about to send out a public policy update, which, you know, kind of summarizes this. Um, we're trying to, obviously, everyone who receives the update um, should be sending in a petition. Um, I can answer any questions. We're hopeful that the different branches will, you know, actually have a webinar, a sponsor with League or, uh, you know, webinars such as this, um, you know, bring the petitions to, um, you know,
to their book club. I mean, obviously in this, in this uh, time of uh, COVID, we might not have a chance to actually hand it over, which is another challenge, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, in getting all these signatures in. But, you know, to the extent that you're doing a Zoom chat with the group, you know, be a great opportunity to mention um, that this process is ongoing and important. When you take a look at the website, Linda, you can see that AUW of Oregon is prominently displayed as uh, one of the uh, members of the coalition. So if you have any questions, let me know. Take care. Uh, another question um, from Mary Holdman. I'm not sure that I totally understood who is getting the 500,000 petitions that you mailed. Could you please clarify that again? Annalyn, you tried sure. to clarify it. <laughs> yeah, I know, I tried. Um, so the 500,000 are high propensity voters that we selected through a, a voter list and these are voters who have voted in at least the last two elections. They need to have their, their households. So when I say 500,000, that's actually households. The amount of voters that we'll be mailing petitions to is actually closer to 1.3 million, um, which is like mind blowing. Um, and it's a lot of petitions, but um, basically that's what those households look like. They're at least two voters in that house who will register to vote and have voted in the last previous two elections. That's how we selected that. We also selected folks who have numbers on file that we can follow up and ask them if they need help or um, if they've gotten it and uh, make sure that, they, that we get that back and we're able to do that follow up with them. A question from Michael Holcomb and they ask, if the petition makes the ballot, when will the commission become active? Will the legislatures be able to prevent or affect the outcome of the petition? Yeah, I think I better answer that. Um, the commission process for choosing the commissions will happen as soon as the ballot measure results are certified, which will be in mid-December of 2020. And it will take uh, a period of several weeks, even maybe a couple of months to actually choose the commissioners by that process. But um, when they go into effect, the legislators will have no say in what they do. Uh, they could conceivably pass a law through the legislative process that uh, will enhance the, the commission's process and uh, add to the uh, criteria perhaps. But uh, that's not a, a constitutional amendment, that would be a statute, and uh, the commission's responsibility is really to the Constitution and ultimately to, to the voters and to the Oregon Supreme Court, which will ultimately decide if they did their job right. Would either any of you like to comment on the fact that the um, uh, census is looking like the numbers are going to come in late. They're asking for a extension on the usual numbers. Um, I guess I better take that one too. Uh, yes, that's worrying actually, because uh, the Census Bureau would like to have a four month delay in delivering the data to the states. That is, normally it would be April 1st, and, but that would delay it until August 1st. And that would give the commission about a, a month and a half or so to actually do their job on with the data. And the legislature would have the same problem, by the way. And so we don't think we'd be any different from the legislature, but uh, it would be, let's call it uh, challenging to get it done in that time. Uh, it could be done if the, commission does a lot of work ahead of time or maybe has some preliminary data, but uh, it, it'll be a challenge. And, and the other part of that is that in order to have that delay, the Census Bureau will have to have a law passed by Congress in order to implement that delay uh, since their current deadline is in law. But uh, given that the current Congress is, has a hard time to agree on anything, uh, that seems at least iffy uh, that they've passed that law. 
It may be, in fact, added to one of the uh, new stimulus bills as a rider of some sort, and, and that way they can sneak it through. But uh, we'll see what happens with that. Okay, I do not see any unanswered questions. Oh, I see one. Uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, it looks like it's from Josie, uh, who is asking about what the campaign is doing for social media. Um, and that social media networks need to promote this. I agree. Um, we want to do a lot more social media in the next few weeks. Uh, we just posted the actual picture. If you go to People Now Politicians on our Facebook, um, I think we have a Twitter and an Instagram. Uh, I can share those links with you all. They're on the website as well. Um, but we do have active social media handles and we are asking our coalition partners to share our posts. Uh, we've had a lot of press releases and those kinds of things out. So I could share the press release that we just had out. Um, we've had people write op-eds and the other kinds of earned media. And so we definitely have uh, communication plans coming up and we're always looking for people to be social media warriors and to share our stuff and to make posts about um, how people can sign the petition. Um, Josie has asked another question. Um, who does the training on making maps, expert demographic, demographers, <laughs> and helps the commissioners consider, demographers, there it is, commissioners consider and use the various criteria needed in drawing the maps? Uh, the commission can hire anybody it wants as their staff, and demographers might be one of them. Uh, they will effectively be doing this for the first time, and so they will probably need some training and help. Uh, I know of an offer from the commissioners that were uh, selected in California in 2011 that they are willing to help uh, train commissioners too. So that's, that's to be determined though. It's up to the commissioners. Okay, now I don't see any more new questions. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. And uh, I think it was a very good discussion and lots of good questions. So uh, do what you can for the campaign. And uh, you have five weeks to get whatever you can get done, done. And uh, I appreciate everything you can do. Me too. Me too. We need to get we need to get in there and get this done. Just don't do anything else for the next five weeks. And yeah. we're gonna, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to say thank you to everyone as well. Um, I know it's been uh, at least I've been confusing myself because I keep referring to we because I'm already transitioning my role in my brain. Um, but uh, my last few days with the league are are in like two days, uh, then I'll be moving on to people not politicians. So you won't see the last of me if you're a league member and have been seeing me for the past two years talking about redistricting. Um, I'll still be the one that's answering um, that's that's there supporting folks through people not politicians. And so um, I'm going to follow up with you all. Um, if I don't, then I'll have a league member do so. But just know that you, all you have to do is contact People Not Politicians if you'd like to talk with me. I'll also share my People Not Politicians email with you all with the other resources I promised I would share. Um, I, of course, want to also share this recording and you're welcome to do what you want with it. You can share it with your members. You can uh, post it on your social media or your YouTube. Uh, we're going to try and edit out the first like five, six minutes of just scrambling around so the video isn't super boring um, but uh, that will be sent your way as well oh thank you Rebecca okay all right goodbye all